Sinet, and today I'll be presenting my proposal presentation for modeling of external radiation exposure to healthcare workers and the general public from nuclear medicine imaging and therapy patients. My supervisors are Mary, Mario Dukalek and Dr. Pedrin Rajan Prasad. So our main motivations for undertaking this research primarily surround the radiation phobia and lack of education surrounding radiation from sonographers and other healthcare professionals. For example, sonographers will ref refuse to perform an ultrasound on a bone scan patient. Um, and then another, an another example is the dialysis ward will call and ask if they can have a gallium 67 patient on the ward for about half a day. And then therapy, um, and a therapy example would be an unexpected surgery being um, required for an ID-131 patient, needing a three hour surgery and the surgical and surgeon team calling to inquire whether this is okay, given the radiation exposure, contamination risk and dose rate. Uh, further to this, another example which has occurred is a cardiac stress test for a nuclear medicine patient. Um, they've had a heart attack and they require a, pace for the, a pacemaker to be fitted. Um, this has then led to an unplanned exposure with not all the staff who were caring for the patient being radiation workers. Um, so in the past 10 to 20 years, we've seen a massive increase in PET CT scans. This has caused an increase in the nuclear medicine patients and in turn increase in the external exposure from said nuclear medicine patients. Uh, due to all of these things increasing, there's been increasing concerns for all parties interacting with the nuclear medicine patients. For example, sonographers, surgeons, um, nurses on the ward, as well as people taking the patients to and from their diagnostic scans and therapies. Um, our current public annual limit is 1 millisievert, whereas the occupational annual limit is 20 millisieverts. However, not all healthcare workers are radiation workers. So, for example, sonographers will come out of the public annual limit of 1 millisievert. Due to sonographers not being healthcare work, not being radiation workers, um, they actually don't come under the occupational annual limit, which means they're not occupationally monitored. This in turn means that when they receive a dose from a nuclear medicine patient, we're unsure of what the dose would actually be when they're performing their scans. In saying all this, there has been some previous research done for the external exposure from nuclear medicine patients. Cormac and Tura in 1998 developed a model to determine the external exposure from RD-131 patients. Um, this includes three te separate templates, each with varying flexibilities. So the first template produced actually um, had a fixed set distance and required a, um, a variety of different inputs. So for example, the contact pattern per hour, activity administrated, the exposure rate at specified distances, decay components for the whole body clearance, dose and dose rate limits. From this, the total exposure was then calculated and the exposure for the contact pattern was also produced. Um, the second template allowed a bit more flexibility, allowing different durations and distances as well. An example of this has been provided um, with the second template there, and you can see that it produces a daily contact pattern. The third template produced then uh, had the main focus of determining when the ID-131 patient was safe to be released back into the general public. Uh, it included more, even further tailored parameters such as date and time. Um, so we can see here from the um, the image that I provided, that there's a lot of different tailored inputs and it is quite um, interactive with the main purpose being that medical physicists would use this. However, this model is actually over two decades old, which means that it's older than I am, um, which definitely leaves room for, their, um, room for improvements. Further research which has been done um, is young in 2013, uh, determined the dose rates measured with phantoms filled with radioisotopes. An example of this has been provided here, uh, where there's a table with each distance being at 10 centimeter increments. This was then normalized to one meter, and then they provided a conversion table by averaging over the normalized values. Young determined this to be a better estimate, a more realistic approach compared to the inverse square law, which they deemed to be too conservative. Mountford and O'Doherty in 1999 actually defined the critical groups which were interacting with nuclear medicine patients. And um, this was categorized into two different categories. We had the hospital workers and people outside of the hospital. So hospital workers included sonographers, uh, surgeons, nurses on the ward, medical physicists, and nuclear technologists. Whereas outside of the hospital included people such as parents of children undergoing um, any radiation therapy, as well as spouses, and even going as far to include people who were sitting next to a nuclear medicine imaging patient on public transport. Um, further to this, Mountford and O'Doherty actually outlined two main methods for measuring the external exposure from nuclear medicine patients. This was the integral dose, the integral dose method, which is where they individually monitor people using personal dosimeters as well as TLDs and determining their dose from nuclear 
<laughs> nuclear imaging patients and therapy patients through this. And then there was a dose rate method, which included measuring the dose rate directly from the patient. Majority of the studies that we've seen um, and the research that we've seen occur actually fall within one of these two groups pretty well. However, the methods for undertaking these two different methods um, vary quite significantly within the literature. Uh, Earl and Badaway went on to produce a critical review on the external exposure to sonographers in 2018. Uh, they outlined various limitations and gaps to do with the literature available. The main limitation being that there was la a lacking of literature available. <laughs> um, further limitations included the sonographers not being occupationally monitored, as I previously mentioned, and then they found it hard to achieve compliance with making sonographers wear TLDs. In addition to this, there's small sample sizes with variable measurements and often the characteristics of the sample size have not been recorded. And different radiopharmaceuticals having different activities were not accounted for. So we don't know the specifics for each scan being undertaken. So this then leads me to our limitations within the research that I've briefly touched on and we're also wanting to close this gap. So the limitations currently include limited radiopharmaceuticals. So majority of the studies actually only investigate one radiopharmaceutical, um, meaning that the different methods being undertaken apply to this only this one radiopharmaceutical. Uh, there is minimal therapy considerations as well. So in the context of ID-131 being used as a radiopharmaceutical, majority of the time it's um, investigated in an imaging um, perspective. So they'll investigate this after the patient's been released into the general public and not while the patient's in, within the hospital care. Uh, another limitation set within the literature is that there's set distances and times, as I provided an example here. Uh, so majority of people who are wearing personal dosimeters, we measure this at set distances for three set times, um, meaning that there's not very much modeling available and it's not tailored to specific individual situations. This leads me to the significance of my research. So the main significance is to remove the uncertainty for the external exposure from nuclear medicine patients. Um, in doing this, you want to tailor this for specific circumstances, uh, for situations which have not previously been explored. For example, extended close range contact shortly after administration, as I mentioned previously, with a patient going to cardiac arrest and requiring a pacemaker to be fitted, or um, emergency procedures, again, the cardiac arrest patient, and then potentially the intensive care unit as well, so the ICU. A nuclear medicine patient on the ICU would also be delivering external exposure to the surrounding patients in the beds. Um, so Charles Gardner Hospital currently has an in-house spreadsheet, so they've developed their own version of this. Um, however, it's not as tailored as we would like it to be, and it, um, <clears throat> and it is mainly for the medical physicists to use. So we want to then expand this to be able to allow a wider user demographic, so allowing all healthcare workers to be able to use this model. So my project aims, um, we have the modeling of external exposure from nuclear medicine patients and the associated risks. My second aim would then be to tailor this model for the input parameters, including type of radiopharmaceutical, admi initial administered activity, self-absorption factor for patients of different sizes, uh, time from procedure to the time from the administration to the procedure, for example, the time from administrating a radiopharmaceutical to a sonographer completing an ultrasound and then external dose rate as well. Once we've tailored these parameters, we want to produce a user-friendly software to be deployed for clinical use. So allowing, as I said previously, all healthcare workers to use this, not just medical physicists. This will be achieved through my research map, which has three separate phases. We have the first phase, which is modeling of external exposure in something such as Excel. We will then follow on with a user-friendly software. Um, I'll be coding this uh, potentially in Python or something else. Um, and then we want to verify the model. So we want to take the model and the software and make sure it produces an accurate result, which we can use in clinical applications. So phase one, um, modeling for the external exposure. Uh, this will require me to determine the external dose from the nuclear medicine patient to the party of interest, uh, including radioisotopes isotope dose rates and self-absorption factors. An example of some of the literature we could potentially use for this has been included here, where you can see there's four separate distances for three separate times for a bone scan using Technisium 99. Um, in addition to this, I will require a comprehensive workflow, um, a comprehensive understanding of the workflow for the nuclear medicine department, such as the times from when the radiopharmaceutical is administered to when the nuclear medicine scan will take place, how long the patient is waiting after administration, when they will come into contact with any other staff members, and when they would have received any other medical attention. In addition to this, we'll then be tailoring this input so that it will align with the clinical applications and hopefully have options which align with practical situations. Phase two for my um, method would then be producing the user-friendly software. Hopefully we're going to achieve this using a graphical user interface or GUI. Um, full disclosure, I've never actually coded one of these before. So this is gonna be me laying a variety of new skills and implementing them pretty quickly. 
Uh, we aim to have a generic version, as I mentioned, with the healthcare workers and nurses and such being able to use this with some more simplified options such as bone scan or liver scan, rather than using the uh, more technical terms that we would use. In addition to this, we do want to have an advanced version which medical physicists can use, allowing them to, deter to select their own self-absorption rate, um, as well as dose rates and other values which they can either measure themselves or attain through literature, which we will be able to provide. Uh, phase three would then be the verification of the model. So we want to verify a model using phantoms, patients, TLD measurements, and potentially Monte Carlo from the literature. Uh, however, we are also potentially looking at, at doing our own measurements for phantoms and TLDs to determine the dose rate. So what are some foreseeable issues that we see? So some problems which we have kind of predicted here um, is mainly surrounding the verification of the model. So I've included an image here which shows an example of a study undertaken which um, shows the TLD measurements at 20 predefined locations in the hand. This is a pretty unique version of um, taking measurements for hand dose rates and produces a different result to the TLD rings that we see. Um, so due to this, the di numerous different methodologies and numerous different sources, although they fall within the two categories of integral dose method and the dose rate method, the way that these are undertaken are vastly different. So we see issues in being able to solidify these and make them so that we are able to validate the model in a meaningful way, but potentially we can modify, we can mediate this by modifying our literature values, or as I mentioned previously, conducting our own measurements. So this is a generic overview of what I want the project to be looking like. So we have an input or clinical situation where the um, where people call us up and give their, us the specific situation they have. We then will estimate the radiation exposure using our model. So either the advanced physicist version or the generic healthcare worker version. From this, the physicist or the software will be able to give radiation advice. Currently, um, the radiation advice which has been provided to sonographers has been included here. And we can see the traffic light system for one hour ultrasound beside a patient at 0.5 meters. So we essentially want to take this out, this current situation and tailor it to a specific scan and specific distance, activity, and everything else as well. Thank you for listening. Were there any questions? <laughs> any questions from Yes, my shoe. Um thanks, Christine. Um I just um you may have mentioned this and I may have missed it. But um, other than emergency scenarios, um, are there many cases where you need sonography right after the injection of radioactive material? So a lot of the time they will try and avoid the situation, like the workflow will be designed so that um, majority of the time it's more favorable to have the ultrasounds occurring before the administration of nuclear medicine. However, it's not always feasible. It's not always able to be achieved. So they, the situation I provided before where a patient had a bone scan and then received a, son a sonogram afterwards, that has occurred and it does sometimes occur with the workflow. Um, so it's for these situations that we kind of want to tailor it. It's not just emergency, but just any sort of medical procedure which is occurring after the administration of radiopharmaceutical. Like immediately after? Um, it's not necessarily immediately after, but enough to for people to be wary about it and have okay. concerns surrounding it. So it's okay. more so to do with like people um, not having the radiation education that we would have and inquiring about it. Right. And then the other thing I wanted to, um, this is more like a comment. Um, the picture you showed with TLDs is stuck to the patients and uh, to the um, operator's um, hands. This one? Um, so, yes. So those are the type of TLDs that are available in most um, places. In the whole WA, we don't have access to these TLDs. So ours are different type and their positioning is, is a bit, um, it, the positioning of it is um, a bit uh, more difficult. So um, keep that in mind for designing your um, experiments. Uh, yeah, the ones in right. WA are rod type, so they're they're not flat. Um, okay. Oh. Yeah, just a general comment. <laughs> okay, Thank that's you. great. Thank you. I'll keep that in concern when we're looking yeah, at verifying sure. the model. <laughs> sure. We can 3D print something as a holder as like a ring and then oh, okay. it will be easy. That's okay. Good one, Martin. Um, Martin, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Christine. It was terrific. Um, I can see the need for like a very comprehensive assessment tool like you're trying to develop it. I'm wondering if it, 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 like it seems it's going to be very, very comprehensive, like spanning radio pharmaceuticals and spanning lots of different scenarios. Um, and I'm wondering if you're going to be able to achieve that within 
the time that you have and if maybe you might need to prioritize um, some of those elements in some way do you think you might need to so we haven't quite worked out the entire aspect like the whole aspect of the um project quite yet we've been looking at the different things that we can alter and specify and like tailor towards the situation um i'm not too sure that we'll be able to achieve everything but i definitely think there's it's worth prioritizing the more important um ones which will which we can see varying a lot more drastically within the circumstances uh, but it's definitely going to be something I'm going to need to consider, considering I've got a valid year to do it, and that's it. <laughs> so we have another question from Andrew. Yeah, I um, just want to say, like, really good presentation. It looks like your project's got um, a lot of different parts to it. it. Looks like you have some coding, some practical parts. So I think it'll be a really good project. Um, I just wanted to go to the slide where you're talking about limitations in research surrounding uh, measuring external exposure from these patients. You're saying that there is limited numbers of or different types of radiopharmaceuticals in research. So I was just wanting to say what kind of different physical parameters or characteristics of the radiopharmaceuticals would likely cause a difference in the external exposure? What, which ones would you expect? So we're seeing with the limited radio pharmaceuticals, majority of the studies are looking at one, um, the different kind of parameters that we would look at, that we would expect. So the, when we're seeing the investigation of the studies, they tend to be um, not looking at specific scans, which is what we would essentially be wanting to look at. They tend to look at an overview of the entire um, annual exposure. So we want to be looking at the individual scans, the different times as well, um, being able to tailor this for each time. Whereas currently, I think the Javet at our study does it at, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 40 minutes from the initial administration. So we want to be able to tailor this so that it's not just at set fixed times um, and the set distances as well. So we want to be varying these. Um, there's also the activities, not all activities are ex explored as well for the administration. So we want to be looking at those as well. Right. And so between individual radio pharmaceuticals, um, so iodine 131, 125, um, TC99, those kind of things, what physical parameters or characteristics would cause a difference in the external exposure? Um, uh, so potentially the patient size could cause a difference in exposure because I know larger patients tend to have a lower external dose rate, uh, which is one of the big ones that we want to be accounting for because none of the literature actually looks at that itself. Okay. And, and, and for the um, pharmaceuticals themselves, so they're... So any physical parameters of, of those that you think would make a difference? Um, I'm not too sure. Uh, potentially the pharmaceuticals being tied to the, um, so like FGG would be different to other, like oh, I forget the ones for them, but the labeling of the radio pharmaceuticals produces different biokinetic effects, if that's what you mean. Right, I think I'm <laughs> probably not being super clear with the question. But those are good answers for um, considering patient factors and so on, yeah. It'll be a really interesting project and um, see how far you can get with with all of those uh, parts of it. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, thank everyone. you. Any other questions? All good? From Kristen? Brilliant. Thanks very much. If you might, could you please uh, 